Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me again for a conversation with a friend of mine, someone who I've not done a show with in over a year now, I think. It is uh, the Carnal Conservative, my good buddy. Uh, how are you doing today, sir? It's been too long, yes. It's been too long. Um, you know, to, di distance does make the heart grow fonder, or absence <laughs> makes heart grow fonder, as they say. Yeah. And yeah. it's... It's just one of those weird things where it's been too long. Like we, we agree on a lot. We disagree on some. And as you might hear in the background, I, I have children's. I have children's, and they are your little children's. Yeah, and uh, well, hey, I think that's hear. great. I don't want to edit those out or uh, change your audio settings because I want to encourage everyone who listens to us to think children are great and they should have a lot more white babies. Yes. Has has cheerins has lots of cheerins, <laughs> and I say white babbies, but I just mean babbies in general. It, it's funny. It's funny how often that that I have to bring up race now because it wasn't until just a few years ago that I even cared at all about race or ethnicity. It's uh, it, it's sort of it reminds me of the old GamerGate meme of the uh, of the GamerGate uh, SS trooper throwing the furry into the gas chamber and said and with with the with the uh, with the meme of. I just wanted to play video games. This is your fault type of thing. That's the way I feel now about having to care about race. It's like I never wanted to care about race. I just wanted to be a part of a functional constitutional republic that had good national values. But now it's all about race and class and sex and gender and all this other mess. Well, this was the this was the battle they wanted to fight. These are these are the terms they wanted to fight under. So um, apparently it, 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 this is the. Uh, this is the paradigm they chose. It's not like we came out swinging with, you know, full hood on with, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, I mean, the the hood is now in in vogue because you have to wear a mask to the store. But I, I'm. Yeah, that was hilarious. I saw the, I saw about that guy who uh in, who wore the California, hood for a mask. Yeah. <laughs> in California, God bless. That, that was pretty great. That was a uh, that was epic troll right there. Yes. But so, uh. Uh, if unless do you have more to add before we uh, get into the meat of what we're going to be handling tonight? Uh, what was it? Well, b back on race, like I, I was, I was reflecting on how extreme, like the whole discussion with race and politics has gotten. Mm -hmm. I, I have a military family, mm -hmm. and they are, um, they're good people. They're, they their entire family is pretty much centered on serving in the military. Uh, Navy uh, is where they focus on. Mm -hmm. I'll let the joke commence there. And <laughs> it's it's strange because we're we're in a hot, contentious thing with the Ahmad Arbery case, mm -hmm. and I had the audacity to share a Stefan Molyneux uh, video. And apparently, if you Google Stefan Molyneux, the words white supremacist – well, of are course the first that, things that pop up. Of course it does, because that's the problem with having a monopoly on the thought exchange of human beings. Uh, my first deep double analysis is about the Overton window and the corporatism that pushes us ever leftward, since Google is basically the primary filter through which Western people get their daily information now. They mm -hmm. purposefully skew things. They'll prioritize articles that, that fit the narrative while making others disappear. They get completely rid of any nationalistic or, or hard right-wing voices. They just bury them in, in the algorithm or purposely trim them from Google searches. And then, of course, they prioritize trash like ADL and SPLC articles that, uh -huh. paints, that paints anyone right of Stalin as a neo-Nazi. It's ridiculous. And, and it's... Uh, Steve Bannon got it half right. He said that we're in the post-truth era. I disagree. I don't think we're post-truth. We are post-trust. Yes. And rightfully so. We, we should right. be uh, completely uh, very skeptical about anything we get from our uh, search results and instead um, actually investigate what the claims are. Like you, you Definitely. To, it, it is so much harder now to know what the hell is going on and to see – uh, who stands for what? About a year because... and a half ago, I went to to using DuckDuckGo uh, as my search browser, and about a year ago, I started comparing it with what was on Google. And in the last year, a DuckDuckGo 
search about anything political or any mainstream news is it has gotten progressively more and more different and and to use their word radicalized towards the narrative and duck duck go like if you search for topics you'll get stuff from right wing left wing centrist international american sources and it's not just the the railroaded narrative of content that google wants to program your mind with and that's that's scary that people can't trust what what is commonplace in their lives. And that's, it's very discombobulating. I'll be honest, mm -hmm. I use Google because it's most convenient. It's what everyone else uses. Mm. But my God, the, the, the way I have to word my search engine is ridiculous. Like I have to yeah. get incredibly specific. Um, I'm just stop using Google altogether unless I'm doing a comparison video or, or I want to <laughs> see what the narrative has to say. Pretty much, pretty much what I do is if there's a news story or something about any anything having to do with global warming or immigration, I'll use uh, DuckDuckGo as my control group. And then to see what the opposition has to say, I just search for the same shit on Google. <laughs> and, and that feeds me what I need to know that is probably lies and what I should say something about. <laughs> so that's well, how I use it, Google. Well, it's that, that, that's a smart technique, as I say. We're, we're post-trust. We need to question pretty much and it, it's it's disturbing because not only do we have to trust uh distrust what we see now mm -hmm. the question is how long has this been going on how, it's how been long going on for a long time now a long I, time. I know and, and we're just waking up to it but you can go back as far as the 70s and the 80s with mm -hmm. all this guard and mm -hmm. and it's, it's disturbing because even recently they came out with the hoax papers um, where leftist academics uh, submitted hoax papers where they did in, in, insane, insane studies oh, about yeah. mm -hmm. like um, consent in the dog park or no rape culture oh, yeah. in the dog park. Mm -hmm. I'll uh, call they, those people leftists. I think that they are more maybe just left leaning. I wouldn't call them leftists, but they, well, they definitely were academics that worked in the university sphere. So probably exactly. left leaning so, of some kind. When I, I read all left, about that. I, I should be I, I should be far more precise. That they, they are, uh, they consider themselves left leaning. They're part of the institutions. They're criticizing, mm -hmm. and even they've come to the conclusion that they are. And and, and this is their exact phrase, or, or I'm paraphrasing it, religiously and dogmatically insane. Yes, yes. Uh, I th that's a very fun read uh, if you want to look into it. I believe they were. Uh, Weren't they stationed in Portland or Seattle? It was definitely one of the uh, West Coast cities. I think it was Portland. One of the, the I think one was focused in, um, at least one was in Portland, and the other ones I think were uh, spread throughout the the United States when they tested getting these uh, papers into academic uh, <laughs> journals. <laughs> yeah, a lot, lots of them were accepted. I remember that it, it's disturbing how many did. Um, especially one of them was just a, a rewording of a chapter of Mein Kampf. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that one too. They, they reworded like, a, a, a Mein Kampf, uh, which of course was about the danger of Jews or whatever, and they replaced it, wasn't it, with just white men? Isn't that what they replaced it with? Uh, white men, white frigid. Uh, if you replaced whatever buzzword it was that Hitler used with white fragility, Oh, yes, it that's what it was. It, right. it, it justified <laughs> the oppression of white people based on their white fragility. Yes, <laughs> I remember that paper. And that one got approved, too. That got approved for it, academic review and circulation. It's just nuts. Oh. But it just goes to show you how, how ridiculous things have gotten. So, yeah, so segueing from that, uh, you were the one that picked the topic for our discussion tonight, so why don't you let the viewers, or the listeners, I should say, because this is a podcast, let our listeners know what our topic's going to be tonight, pretty please. Well, the, the topic here is, I, I had a black pill moment when, when it comes to um, the concept of using the law in its educational uh, function. Meaning that society, whether we like it or not, is informed by the laws and the legal precedents of that society. And it seems that the left is willing to use it, but my side isn't. And that yes. to me is disheartening because it's it's a front on the culture where we can't ignore. And even the Trump presidency reflects this when he is uh, 
stalking the uh, the the court system, albeit very quietly, mm -hmm. with conservative judges, with the uh, strict constitutionalists. And and I hope that that makes a massive difference. But the fact that we well, are not to, we, we not go, not go to uh, not to speak ill of the right here, but uh, I'm not a fan of Judge Kavanaugh. I defended the shit out of him whenever he was attacked. But when it comes to how he's adjudicated, he's very much in line with the uh, neocon uh, let's spy on our own people type of stuff. He he's very much a statist big brother type, uh, at least looking at how he's adjudicated in the past. While I do think he's probably a better choice than some leftist shill of a judge, he's he's not exactly my guy, so to speak. But pl oh, no, and, please continue. And, and in that regard, I mean, there, there's plenty to criticize him on. And I'm, uh, I'll be honest, I'm when it comes to national security, that that is important. But my focus is on our social interactions and the social norms that we adopt. And that is the educational aspect of the law that we have neglected and that we're not pushing uh, hard enough on. And it seems that it, it's just another weapon of the left that the right refuses to pick up. And I find that very uh, disconcerting. That's a problem with leftism in general, and if you'll allow me to speak for a moment – Oh, one, of the, one of the things that I got into it with someone on the uh, on a live stream, I won't mention who, but uh, just two days ago on a live stream, I think it was Friday, it was either Friday or Thursday or Friday, um, I was talking to someone about the the ever encroaching by any means necessary uh, mess that the left has used for the last several generations. Mm -hmm. so I was looking at the writings that came from the Frankfurt School back in the at the uh, the early portions of. Uh, of the Great War era in the 1900s, moving up towards the Cultural Revolution. I don't appreciate the methods through which the McCarthy era witch hunt for commies used, but I understand their goal. I understand their fear because they saw what was happening, like we see what's happening now. And and, and what and what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is even looking at the literature that was behind university leftism uh, back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, even then they were talking about the the ugliness of heterosexuality and the patriotic the the patriarchal norm of the nuclear family. They were wanting to sexualize children or have sexual liberation with children. Talking about letting your uh, letting your children be naked with you when you have family gr group meetings with other families. Just all kinds of degeneracy. And this is not yeah. something new. A lot of people on the right seem to think this is new. No, this has been slow rolled on us for the last three or four generations. It's just coming uh -huh. to a crescendo now because my generation, the Gen X and the millennials, your generation, the one that came after us, has basically been fully indoctrinated from primary education forward with this shit. And just like Yuri Bezmenov warned us about back in the 70s and 80s, the, the mind poison – of this institutional leftism is almost impossible to purge out of people. It, it's almost impossible. And when you pair that with the standing on principles of the – now, when I say libertarian or liberal here, I don't mean it in the modern stupid sense. I mean it in the old 1800s sense. America, uh -huh. America is based, especially the, the constitutionalist uh, – uh, what I consider to be normal right-wing American, is very much steeped in – ethical values of the the individual Western way based on British common law and our constitution. And as such, they don't and have never ascribed to the by any means necessary uh, 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 motto of leftism. They do stand on ethical and religious values. They stand on playing by the rules and playing fair. That's why mm -hmm. I believe for the last four generations, we, meaning regular right-wing Americans, have been constantly losing ground decade by decade because we'll stand on principle and sort of like how the leftists have their version of not in my backyard type of lefties. That's sort uh -huh. of the, the ethical moral version on our side of, well, at least I got my principles, uh, even though, you know, the streets are full of, you know, dildo wearing pride marchers and drag queens are showing their dicks to your kids at, at libraries. At least you're standing on your principles. Yeah. Well, how good are your principles going to be when the whole country collapses? So that's exactly. why that's why I've had a lot of malcontent with 
even even mainstream politicians that I think might mean well beneath the veneer and the lies that they have to spin, they're ineffective. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't name a single thing that conservatives in America have conserved in 50 years. I can't name a single thing that they've actually conserved. Can you? You're, you're not wrong, but I, I but can I speak as to sort of the philosophical foundation of where that comes from? And certainly, please. In, in, in talking with um, not just the right, but the religious, in terms of enforcing uh, cultural and social norms, mm -hmm. potentially in the law or just you know in your it, just in a more uh, firm manner. It come, they, their reluctance actually comes from uh, two philosophers, uh, St. Augustine and um, Thomas Aquinas. Mm -hmm. and what is curious is that the, the, the ethos of these men come from the fact that they were uh, men of the cloth. They, they were men of uh, religious thought. They were religious leaders, and they, they were supposed to have – this ethos, this were they both uh, Catholic priests? This, this authority in, in in terms of uh, righteous behavior and, and religious sentiment. Mm -hmm. And when I looked over their justifications for permitting things like prostitution, um, Thomas Aquinas is uh, follows uh, Saint Augustine in the sentiment that, well, we have to permit prostitution because. If we don't let the, the small masses have their uh, vices, then it'll just blow everything up. We'll, it, it'll be like a house without a, without a latrine. We'll, there'll, there'll be shit all over the place. Yes. But it's very wise. It, 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 it's wrong, though. It, it, if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, the biblical justification for the law at that was given, uh, it was very specific. It, what, what it said was, uh, thou shalt not permit your daughter to play the whore, lest you essentially become a nation full of whores. Yes, when I say that it's that it's wise, I just mean the there has to be a sieve to let off pressure. Just like how the more you try to control a market, an economy, the more that the criminal element rises to power. That's why almost every socialist or strong authoritarian country that tries to uh, firmly from the top down control its market sees a massive spike in organized crime, just like we're seeing in mm -hmm. Mexico. So the, the reason I think it's wise is because I don't think that a society based on Christian values should try to use authoritarian statism to enforce those values. But this is where the conundrum comes in. Because we have socially lost ground and had our social fabric and morals destroyed by leftism, which is anti-religious, which is anti-God, I believe that we're going to have to take a more forceful hand in getting back normalcy. Because well, uh, uh, Allow me to introduce a, a go bit ahead. of nuance. Sure, please. There, there, there's a reason why I, I frame this dilemma in, in a particular way as the educational um, use of the law. It's purely – it's mostly educational. Like, for example, enforcing prostitution even though it's illegal is practically impossible, Right. You, it, it, which gives it a, a, almost a pseudo-illegal status. Like, you can be a prostitute, but getting caught at it, very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it is reasonable to suppose that perhaps the law's true function is to educate society as to what is good and bad behavior. That's what I mean when when it comes to uh, enforcing these these values oh, and using the law as an educational notion. Mm -hmm. Here's here's the problem though is we have is what does the law teach our society today, and we can see how it's affecting our um, our populace. It's not we we've gotten uh, one of the one of the major. Um, examples of this is abortion, which has never been popular. Right. Never. Yet it was shoved down our throats without a vote, without um, without any... Um, it started back in the 70s with safe, legal, and rare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. remember, remember safe, legal, legal and rare? I do. <laughs> what, what, I very much what, do. What a, I... What a novel it, idea by today's standards, huh? <laughs> oh, oh, I know. Like, there was... Um, 
what we had a post in the Liberalist where a a female student uh, submitted a a project where she alleges that she would uh, impregnate herself via uh, sperm banks, sperm donor, mm -hmm. and then she would uh, mid, uh, herbally take a, a concoction that would force her to miscarry or abort or mm -hmm. something of that nature like 28 days later. Okay. And she stored all of the remains in a tube and wanted to present this as a art piece. That is peak Weimar Republic degeneracy right there. <laughs> now... The reason why it was controversial, believe it or not, is because Yale told her to get the fuck out. <laughs> they rejected <laughs> it. <laughs> if, when and where was this? Oh, it was, I think it's a 2013 case. Okay. Um, so that's fairly I, recent I'll, then, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll send you the link to it uh, as soon as <laughs> okay. we're done chatting. But my, I, I heard this story, like, and it was a big deal. Like, in the liberals, the discussion is, should this be allowed? And I'm like... Well, obviously not. No, no one said <laughs> safe, legal, and rare, and for your art pieces. Exactly. Exactly. It's terrible. <laughs> no one, no one said, "Hey, let's." I'm, I'm officially referring to the slippery slope as Schrodinger's fallacy. One abortion is a very difficult issue for me when it comes to the legality and the application. I obviously don't like abortion ethically. Obviously, it's not good, but. When it comes to how you can possibly adjudicate that or um, prevent that with laws and, and uh, police or state force, uh, much like prostitution, it's so difficult, it's, it, it's practically not worth the effort because uh, like I was talking about taking a, a firm control of the economy just leads to black market, I, I don't think that we need to – uh, with state force stop abortion because that's only going to force people who already are going to get abortions into getting them in less safe environments and it's going to lead to more problems. That's why instead of trying to attack the laws or make it illegal now, I think fighting the cultural battle is the smarter way to go there. Yeah, Culturally, if we're, going, slightly, if we're going, going to succeed at all, well, just give me a second. Because okay. I think we need to win culturally and, and create a cultural revolution to go back to some type of – because America is a center-right country. It really is. Most mm -hmm. people, even still today, are center-right or, or uh, more than center-right leaning. Most Americans are. And if we can defeat the, 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 multi, the multinational media boss and defeat the leftist boss, then I – I think it'll be much easier to walk back the massive numbers of abortions that are being performed because we can start fighting it culturally. And the reason that I don't think we – I'm not saying that I, I, I don't want to fight abortion legally. I just don't want to yet. I don't think we're there yet. Just like how I'm an ANCAP at heart, but I don't want to try to start breaking down the state and getting rid of the military yet because if we start doing that now – then other statist powers are just going to steamroll us and take away what, what we have. So it's sort of like a, a, a crime of necessity or an evil of necessity. I think tr coming down hard legally on abortion is low on the totem pole when it comes to things that we need to prioritize in our attack to take back our nation. Now, go ahead with what you were going to say, please. Well, I'm, I'm just going to – Slightly disagree with them and provide a, a little uh, perspective on it. Uh, I think America is more than able and willing to accept a paradigm, a, a world, a, a legal structure in which uh, abortion is completely illegal. I think that's what they want. Um, I, I agree and, with you. I agree with you now, on that. I'm just there, saying that I think that there are more important things to focus on with but, our, our but, cultural but, revolution needs. But but you, you brought up concerns about women um, who would seek abortions uh, anyway. Um, there was a, a major expose by one of the original um, activists for abortion. Mm -hmm. And later on in his life when he became Catholic, he revealed that the statistics that, that they would cite for justifying abortion, that there were like 50,000 women dying a year for back alley abortions, they were completely bullshit. 
Well, then, then they, perhaps if I reviewed uh, numbers and statistics and, and what is true and false about what I've learned, then I might actually agree more with you. So I, uh, those of you listening, don't don't quote me as as the stance that I just took being uh, a well educated and erudite stance because I have not thoroughly studied abortion and I haven't studied it at all for many years. So perhaps with what you know, uh, I might actually change my stance to be more in tune with you to where we need to reprioritize it and put it high on the totem pole. So uh, I, I stand to be possibly corrected and change my view on that. And in, in fact, if you look at his um, his his confession and the, the numbers that he posts, abortion like back alley abortion deaths never rose to more than it never it never breached 300 a year really as opposed for, to for the entire like, united states for the entire united states no, that's definitely no a lot lower than what i remember reading i remember it oh, in the thousands every year oh yeah it, it was it, it was it was absolutely infinitesimal hmm. in, okay uh compared to what they were reporting and what that shows us is that when abortion is taken off the table Women want their children. Women are relieved when that option is taken off, and it puts society in a gear so that we now have to focus on other things like, you know, taking care of the children, taking care of the woman, taking, making sure that there is a, uh, a stable provider for her. You know, I, I am obviously far more wholesome. Uh, I, I'm on. obviously in favor of all that stuff, just so you know. Um, okay. And if – if if I if I'm wrong about the things I've read, which of course I probably am, knowing how much everything that I've been taught the last forty years is lies, if if it is true that it is not like uh, outlawing a vice, like you know cigarettes or booze or whatever, if mm -hmm. if the numbers don't add up with that basic line of philosophy when it comes to the criminalization of things and people still doing it anyway. Then mm -hmm. I I would definitely change my stance on it and reprioritize making abortion completely illegal, uh, more in line with what it used to be a long time ago. Uh, I would be a much stronger proponent for that than I am now. So, I, I believe that and, we we've reached a good agreement point on this. And, and that that's what I mean by social enforcement is mm -hmm. you know that there are so many topics like this where we have been systematically trained to believe that, oh, if, if we take any action, we'll create this black market, okay. this massive black market, and that's not necessarily the truth. Okay. We need, right. to, we need to investigate and um, really have trust in the, uh, the goodness of Western humanity that we have developed in our nations and really live up to the hope of the lives they want to live in. Definitely. And and I agree with you about most Americans not liking abortion because every poll I've seen, people who are pro-abortion are very low regardless of their political leanings. So I, I definitely don't think abortion is a very popular thing that people like. Uh, so – and there – your audience might not know this because it, it's been a year since I've been on your show, but mm – -hmm. um, I was a huge – like the uh, the gay marriage battle mm -hmm. was a huge part of my life because um, my religious community took a huge stand in it in the state of California. Mm -hmm. um, we, we fought for the vote to have marriage stay between a man and a woman, and we won it twice. And there is a notion today that um, society changed to accept gay marriage, and that's why, why it's legal. And that's also wrong. I don't know where they flipped the script on that. I don't know why people forgot that it was a Supreme Court case, not never a vote. Right, like because there, outside, outside of the leftist bastions like New York City and Los Angeles and Portland, Oregon, the, the majority of people still, even in 2020, do not like marriage being, uh, this, being considered the same legally for same-sex uh, people as it is for traditional coupling. And, and here's the strangest thing. I was in California when they rejected it, when they rejected gay marriage twice. California rejected it twice. Yes, because a, a large and, portion of its populace, and, until massive immigration came in, uh, made the state rather heavily red outside of the cities. And it probably is still that way today. Oh, and I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, 
So and for the, those, those of you that are listening in, that are not American, the colors are flip-flopped here. In America, red means right and blue means left. I know in other countries it's the opposite, just just for those of you that, that aren't American listening. True. And what is oh, – oh, this is what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. I honestly might have to be thanking some of those illegal immigrants because they're probably a lot – were a lot more conservative than those who wanted to bring them over. Yeah, definitely. I think that um, I think that even though a lot of Latino people that are pumped into the country have more traditional conservative religious values, I, I'm still sort of confused as to why Latino population, uh, the L Latino demographics in America tend to vote left instead of right. That that's always been a puzzler for me. Do Do you think it's just because of a sort of grandfathered in uh, notion of the right is is some kind of xenophobic or racist, and so they don't want to vote for them because of the media lies. Do you think that's why? I I think it's two things. One, I think they feel indebted to the Democratic Party for being in the United States, mm -hmm. and it might be. And this is just me speculating. There's no data on this. It might be a rejection of their homeland. They I see. being th them being away from Mexico don't want to. Uh, have even uh, Mexican values. They want to be. Um, they want to be independent values. So they might, out of a loyal combined loyalty to the uh, to the DNC, and sort of like a rejection of never wanting to go back to Mexico, despite you know waving its flag on the weekend. Mm. Um, they feel like they e even want to reject their inner their their foundational Catholic teachings when it comes to being – because Mexico is largely conservative. Like mm -hmm. people don't know that, but most Mexicans are in fact very strongly conservative. In fact, I was very proud when I watched a documentary about uh, Mexican citizens, despite it being illegal to do so, arming themselves and kicking the cartels out of their, their city, their, well, their I, little village. I lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico for almost a decade, and I got to meet a lot of Mexican people, both legally, both legal and illegal immigrants, and almost all of them had very – what I would consider to be right-wing traditional conservative values, but the few that I knew well enough to talk to about voting, they all voted for the DNC. And the ones yeah. that I asked personally, even though this was only like a dozen people – is because they had the notion that the Republican Party was a party that represented racism and xenophobia, even though I don't think that's true. Like, if I, I now maybe a little xenophobia if you want to use a leftist word, but I mm -hmm. definitely don't think that the RNC is racist. I think that is just yeah. a complete, complete media smear about the RNC. Well, not, I mean, the, the, and don't get me wrong. I don't, I'm I, not a fanboy of, of the RNC. I, I don't like either of our of our political parties, <laughs> but. But that, that's that's a, that's a topic for another day. <laughs> but but no, the I do think that media lies are heavily or heavily complicit in why the massive amount of Central and South American immigrants that come here vote left. Well, now when I say the rejection of their their foundational Catholic beliefs, that's not necessarily the first generation, um, you know, fresh from the border mm -hmm. um, immigrant. You're talking it's about second gen. It, it, it's their children who go to university that you know feel compelled out of loyalty to the DNC to kind of uh, throw away their their traditional roots. Their, and I think um, another reason is when you look at uh, at immigrants uh, from Mexico and South America, a I believe it's either double or triple the number of those families have either complete or uh, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Either complete or partially. Or either complete or partially um, funded through welfare programs, and I think that these children that grow up here, having their heads full of you know low quality uh, public education lies mixed with university lies and media lies, I think that on top of them feeling like welfare good, free market bad, I think that that leads second and third generation migrants from Central and South America to vote left. Uh, I think it's an economic thing too because they believe that it is an overall good to have high taxes and lots of welfare programs because they grew up in it and that's all they knew. Okay, I, I, and I completely agree with you. There, there, there is a problem with 
the way uh, how how would you call it? it? It's the pipeline. It's the pipeline yeah. from an illegal immigrant to a loyal DNC voter, mm-hmm. and it it just goes to to kind of reinforce kind of what I'm saying about um, the law being an educational tool because God knows we don't have education. That's not that's not in our um, our bag of tricks on the right. We mm-hmm. don't have any any foothold in any uh, educational system. Not at all. Um, so we of course which is have sad to because I I, I wish we did. But uh, you, you and me both. You and me both. But um, let, I'm gonna switch gears just a little bit. J- just please. To give We've audience. reached the half hour mark, so let's change topics. Let's pick something new. Go ahead. Well, I'm I'm just I'm just gonna switch gears just a little bit about. Uh, what would you say about making um, or holding up the sanctity of the American flag? Should burning the flag, if we want to promote um, uh, nationalism and pride in our nation and, you know, uh, the, the civic national values that we should have, should burning the flag defacing it be illegal? I don't think so. I, I think that's kind of a, a pedantic thing to argue about because it's just a piece of cloth, The which ironically – if you hate America and burn the flag, you are ironically exemplifying what the flag stands for, which is your freedom from a state government to keep you from doing what you want to do by creed and ethos, which is what the, mm. which is what the flag stands for. So it, I, I don't like heavy-handed statist things because I want the state to be a tool of the nation, not the other way around. I want the people who live here to know that at any time they can take a big old dump right on the state government and say, this is crap, I hate it, you know, I, I don't like it, look at this, I'm burning this flag, I'm crapping on this politician, uh, I, I hate A, B, C, D, and E about our legislation, and I don't want law to ever say that you cannot do that. I, I think that is anti-American and anti-Constitution. Uh, I, so I, I, I am against sanctioning the uh, destruction of the flag. Okay. that That's fair enough. So that this this is where we come at an impasse. We agree that it might be good or beneficial to perhaps use the law in this educational uh, manner. The question is, where do we start and where is it appropriate? Oh, oh, for sure, for sure. I get you. I just, I just don't think. I, I, like I said in my first sentence, I think it's kind of pedantic and and, and nitpicky about the flag. But you've you, you've partially convinced me on the abortion thing, and. I, the more I, I, I will, I will go and read about that when we're done. Uh, so I might change my mind about uh, criminalization of, of abortion again. Um, when it comes to other things, though, I'm right there with you. I think we need to heavily enforce and and criminalize uh, illegal immigration. We need to actually enforce it and make it worse and punish it. I also think that um, making the federal um, sort of uh, I misspoke. I think that as a nation. Accepting same-sex partnership as being completely equivalent to traditional marriage is wrong. We should not have done that. I'm not saying that we should never let people of the same sex live together because you can't stop people from loving each other. You just can't. Well, and then, well, but and I, I think that we thing. shouldn't. I think that with laws, though, there are some things that you need to at least passively enforce. And I think we need to be a lot harder. Uh, by by axing WIC and other welfare programs that uh, subsidize Agreed. single mothers, we need Agreed. to we need to come down harder on that. We need to make both marriage and divorce harder to obtain. We need to make people work harder for those things. And also, I think that when it comes to the the raising of children and education, we need to make better uh, both state and federal laws around how and why children need to be educated. And I think that we need to bring back a resurgence of private education and religious education uh, as oh, not, I'm, as not being I'm, demonized I'm, as something stupid or or irrelevant. I, I am of the uh, very unpopular or popular opinion based on which side of the internet you're on. The Department of Education just needs to be completely gone. Maybe Com- maybe not maybe gone. not in a sudden way because I don't want to just leave a vacuum. But one of the primary things on my <laughs> on my ladder to end the cap utopia, one of the primary <laughs> one of the primary rungs on that ladder is doing away with public state education because we have seen for the last eighty years what a travesty public education is. I mean, look mm-hmm. look at the like. 
what what is it like only 60 percent of, of high school graduates in america can even identify their state on a globe it, it, it's oh, pathetic God. it's pathetic and, and i just i just feel like especially in big cities like again hypocritical left the these leftists in, in new york chicago portland los angeles san francisco they have the worst the worst public education where even uh -huh. where is even though I don't like it, at least rural public education is usually higher caliber, but but yep. but city based is just abysmal, and especially in like this is more more on the hypocrisy of the left how they are always uh, you know oh the 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 black community the Latino community we have to help we have to do this okay well the ghettoification of all these major cities because of these not in my backyard neoliberal types of the last forty years. The places where the vast majority of the black populace and the Latino populace in America have to live and go to school are dog shit. They get terrible <laughs> schools. They're not enforced. They live in terrible rundown places. They're government assisted. There's almost no work there, so they're stuck in it forever. It's like a it's like a indentured servant class based on your ethnicity, which ironically is sort of what the left champions these days. And 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 these these asinine leaders uh, these asinine leftist leaders in the big cities, they want to make the entirety of the nation like that, which just, it just it's it's so hypocritical and awful. And I'm surprised that not more black and Latino people have woken up to this. I'm glad to see more of them are now. And I hope that uh -huh. the next couple of years we're going to see a big swing away from the DNC. But that's just me hoping. I don't know. It It, it is it is a vast hope. But just one more question on, on the um, – on the question of enforcing uh, the law so that it promotes uh, some some sort of social cohesion, please. Um, and, and I think you would like this one: um, making English the official language. Oh yes, yes, yes! I want to enforce that everyone in American schools, businesses, everywhere, unless you're in your home or in a community, like a community center or whatever, you are required to only speak English. I think yeah. that is a binding factor. I think that language is even more of a binding factor than religion, which is like top of the list also. Agreed. I, I mean, how ridiculous is it <clears throat> that we cannot expect someone to speak and read our language when it's all we use for every legal document, for exactly. uh, road signage? It, it's just common sense, and yet for some bizarre bullshit reason they decided not to enforce that particular standard and, exactly. it, and it's it's these kinds of things that the right really needs to you know pick up and you know roll up their sleeves and say we've had enough and i'll use albuquerque new mexico as an example again there is a lot right. of both legal and illegal immigrants in albuquerque new mexico and the vast the vast majority of schools places of business fast food restaurants they have staff that don't speak English well or don't speak English at all. At all. At, at all. all. And it's it's pathetic because sometimes going to fast food to pick up food for somebody or you know picking up uh, breakfast to to take into the uh, uh, the clinic that I was at a lot, I would I would swing by to you know get a bunch of sausage biscuits or whatever when they were on sale for the, for the team, and I would be greeted at McDonald's in Spanish, and when I would try oh to order God. in English, they would have to put me on hold and get someone who spoke English. Like that, that right there is pathetic because these young kids that only speak Spanish working at the McDonald's, they didn't move here. They were born here and grew up here. They should speak English, but oh they're not God. even expected to speak English for work. What kind of shit is that? Like that, that's despicable. Let, let, let me tell you a funny story. When I was, when I was little, I grew up, as I said, I grew up in California. They did not have a place for me in a regular preschool class so they wanted me wanted to put me in the bilingual class and That's crazy so, uh, they, they wanted to put me in the bilingual class and my mother asked him my mother just looked him straight in the eye and said so he's going to be learning english italian right <laughs> because you know we come from a traditional italian family so she wanted her culture enforced and they couldn't accommodate her so oh, of course guess not what happened I, I i got put in a regular english class because, of course, you know, of course, the, of course, the machine is not going to teach Italian. That's the birthplace of fascism. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't want to. They don't want to promote the 
the the values of my culture. Fuck them. No, don't I'm I'm just I'm just kidding about that. I I don't think that Italians are fascists. I'm just making a Mussolini joke there. It's it's bizarre because um, I, I actually, you know, what, that will be a topic for another time. Okay. I have some family history <laughs> with that, and it's. Maybe, maybe we'll talk about that the next time we have a conversation, which, by the way, we should make more often than just once a year. We should do this at least every month or so. Yeah, because, I mean, this is good shit. I'm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, th these are the questions that need to be raised. When it comes to using laws in, in the reverse uh, of, of what we've been led to believe, uh, politics, of course, is downstream of culture. And w since politics are what make the laws, one could say – well, yes, uh, carnal conservative, aren't your laws downstream from culture? Wouldn't they represent uh, what the culture wants? What is your argument to that standard argument? I'd say to that standard argument that it seems evident from the leftist tactics that we have seen recently that that's not necessarily the case, that when – that it is demonstrable. It is demonstrable and clear through the past 10 to 20 years that it can go in the reverse, and it often does when it comes to um, to social standards and social norms. Okay, can the you law, cite me? Can you cite me one obvious example of the last 20 years, please? I, I've given you two. Um, there, there is uh, abortion and its prevalence in society. So, this abortion and gay marriage. Then, Th those are good ones. Th th those are those are the top two. Yeah, and they have shifted. They, they haven't shifted the hearts and minds of the people, but they've shifted what is acceptable for them to say and do in the public square. The, so you're saying that even though it doesn't change people at first, it it dramatically hastens the shift of the Overton window to what you can talk about and what the media will cover. Precisely. And just like we learned from 1984 and the cyberpunk fiction that we've read growing up. That is the main tool of the Ministry of Truth. That is the main tool of statist and megacorp propaganda and, is and, what, and what you are allowed to talk about, uh, what you are allowed to say with the platform. And, and my message to conservatives, libertarians, to anyone who is obviously going to instinctively balk at this notion is, yes, it is a tool to the left. Yes, it's dirty. Yes, it is slightly authoritarian in nature. But you need to trust yourselves to be the arbiter of these rules. Yes, I, I, because and, that's and, ultimately what it comes down to. Definitely, it's but too I'd like to say something here about uh, about libertarian and uh, classic liberal values. Uh, but I'm an ANCAP at heart, uh, uh, or a minarchist, I guess. But I have made my peace in the last year with nationalists, nationalism, and even a little bit of statism because. I think that unless we are willing to use the existing system, the the tool of media, and the power of the state to fight against the things that are going to destroy us, we're going to lose no matter what we do. Because if we stand on classic liberal and libertarian values, which in my opinion are exemplified by the United States Constitution in the American way – we are going to be outbred and replaced in less than a hundred years. So we have to take, we have to side our side with nationalists and statists and come down from our libertarian uh, mountain of uh, ethics and values to actually band together and use nationalistic application of state power just for self preservation at this point. And I don't want to say that I'm a nationalist just out of pragmatism because I love my nation. I love America. I love the Constitution and what it stands for, and I think that there's a reason why America became the hegemony on planet Earth. I don't think it was just accident. I don't think it was just the luck of the draw. I think that the people who made this nation what it was between 50 and 150 years ago really had something. They really had something. And I think that we yeah. need to fight to, to preserve that and get back what we've lost by any means necessary. And I hate saying that, but it's true because unless we're willing to take some of that that ideology of the left by any means necessary, we're going to lose no matter what we say or what we do. So that's why we I'm are. that's why I'm on and board with with using using the machine against the left. I'm on board with using activism and trying to get people uh not 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 lose their jobs or anything, but I I'm all for 
using the leftist platforms like Twitter and YouTube and Google against those who who are trying to destroy us. So that's why I'm not above um, uh, these awareness campaigns that try to keep tabs on leftist mouthpieces and Democrats and trying to use Me Too against them and shit like that. Mm-hmm. I, f- I feel ugly about it, but I feel less ugly about that than just sitting back and watching everything I care about go up in smoke. You know what I mean? I, I do, and I, I have a few words of solace in, in that regard. Um, you, you said that the American culture has become um, – homogenic and that the foundations thereof was that they had something. I forget which founding father said it, but they they basically said that this democracy, that this experiment would not survive unless it was built on um, essentially Christian values. I'm but pretty sure a, that was Jefferson that said that. Yeah, you, 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 need, a, you need a Christian ethic to maintain the, the social fabric of, of the nation, especially with the liberties that, that were given. And there is a a tale in in the Bible about a prophet. Mm-hmm. This is this is important because it, it shows the Christian ethos when it comes to uh, authoritarian power and its use. There is a tale about a prophet who, in the times of a great wickedness, the the king had gathered all of the priests and was about to execute them. So what he did, what this prophet did, is he said, "All right, fine." Build me two altars, and uh, we're going to have a showdown. You you try and call your god, and I'll call mine. So they do, and they try to uh, summon their god to uh, to accept the offering. And of course, the god doesn't answer. Now, in in typical fashion, the prophet calls upon his god, and it not only consumes the offering, it's uh, it consumes the offering, licks up the water around the offering, and then the prophet and the people slaughter all of the false priests of this wicked king, and then he liberates the uh, the prophets in the cave that had been gathered for execution. That is a great show of what can be called authoritarian force. What is curious – also, That's also some pro-Yahweh propaganda, but go on. But what is even more so curious is what – that prophet does after he finishes this task. He goes off and goes by himself and seeks the will of the Lord. He doesn't continue. He doesn't seek more power. He doesn't try to assert himself anymore. He simply did what he had to do to get it done. Well, and that is go ahead. That is okay. a Christian ethic. And that is what I wish people would trust themselves to know and have the, the discernment to do. Well, I'm right there with you ethically of rising up when you need to. Well, it's, the, it's the whole spirit of American Revolution is you, you do ugly things to secure what has to be secured, but you do not repeat the ugliness of the ones that you just overthrew. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. unfortunately in the world that we live in, Governments have become these bloated monopo states which control so much, and the system itself needs to recapitulate. It is self – it's self uh, – I don't want to say self-propagating, but it's so – it's built into these massive bureaucracies, the necessity to stay afloat. They will never willingly get rid of laws or, or disempower themselves. So that's why I am so reticent to want to have some kind of uprising or revolution because in the last hundred years, every revolution that I can point to, that like the 17 or 18 that I've studied, when the uprising happens, the people that come next are just as authoritarian, if not worse, than what they overthrew. That's why the American Revolution is very unique because in my opinion, what came afterwards was a boom of freedom and healthy living and Christian values and a lot of great stuff for the Anglo kind that came after the American Revolution. It wasn't well, was, it wasn't like a it wasn't a you know a Che Guevara or a Paul Pot or or whatever. Like it was actually something great that happened. So that's the kind of thing that I, I have faith that, that we can do again, hopefully without any fighting or bloodshed. Hopefully just a cultural revolution is all it'll take. But well, it, we have to exactly. be willing to get our to get our hands bloody, so to speak, when it comes to doing the things that we're ethically against, like you know, uh, using the media against people or trying to use state power to change the laws to to you know 
instead of letting uh, the laws be downstream from culture, getting ahead of things and, and trying to fix the laws because we've had two generations of brainwashing from you know leftist public schools and shit. So anyway, um, that's – I guess I should stop talking on that or I'll blather forever. Well, I'll, I'll just pick up where you left off. And the, the reason why the American Revolution was so um, beneficial is because in, in its heart of hearts, it was not a revolution. Revolutions are generally fought for some future ideal that they have not yet achieved. The American Revolution, by stark contrast, was trying to fight to maintain the degree of happiness they had already made for themselves. Okay. Th I, I take your point. That, that is a big difference. So in a way, that's what we're fighting for now. It precisely, and you okay. need to trust in yourself to get it back and to fight for that. Okay. I think that's that, a really healthy and positive note to end on. So why don't you tell me some finishing thoughts about that, and then I'll, I'll respond and we'll wrap it up. Well, uh, my finishing thoughts on that are, you know, don't be afraid to assert for the values that you want in society by any means necessary, because at this point, that is precisely what is necessary. And we can the, – the left and its – and the false idols that they have built for us have failed us again, and we need mm -hmm. to hold them to task. Well, in that, I agree, and I've been talking to a few people that are planning different types of armed and uh, unarmed marches and protests for the 4th of July this year, and I'm not going to say where, but I am going to be taking part in one of them. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be armed or not, but um, I don't know if I want that kind of heat. But I th encourage all Americans listening to this right now, meet up with your local right-wing reactionary groups, meet up with your militias, meet up with your people who love freedom, organize armed if you can or unarmed if you can't, protests and marches on your state capitals and even Washington, D.C. itself if you live close enough to do that. Because this 4th of July, all real Americans need to make a stand. We have to make a stand and show that we are going to demand change or else because this is America. We hold the guns at the government, not the other way around. That's the way it should be. So that's what I'm going to close with. Thank you for joining me, Carnal Conservative. I always enjoy our talks. Uh, do you want to uh, talk about any radio shows or podcasts or content that you want to shill before we get off here? Yeah, you can find me on uh... – you can find me on Twitter. You can find me on uh, uh, Spotify. I'm always the carnal conservative. And to everything that has just been said, all I have to say is amen. <laughs> amen, brother. Amen. So I'll, I'm going to leave links to the carnal conservatives website and social media links in the uh, description below. You can check him out there. And as always, thank you, my my loyal Yisraelites. Thank you, newcomers, and thank you uh, to the Carnal Conservatives fans who have come to listen. I hope that all of us can have a better future. And remember, anything worth keeping or worth having is worth fighting for. So stand up for your rights and say no to the government. Let them know that we're the boss of them and they are not the boss of us. Goodbye and God bless. <laughs>